hello. And the winner is Reading Aloud in the category Best Television Programme Offering Inspirational Ideas on Books for the Classroom. Today I'm at the British Library in London seeing some real envelopes being opened as we go behind the scenes of the biggest children's book competition in the UK. Coming up, tension and excitement as the contenders line up for the big prize. The winner of the Nestle Children's Book Prize gold medal is... But we ask whether there are too many literary awards. There's feline role play in the classroom. Feline killing him and strangling his guts out. And our panel are on cloud nine with a novel that spans centuries and continents. You know, you couldn't find a better location for the Nestle Children's Book Prize ceremony than this, one of the world's greatest libraries. Here, they hold a copy of every publication produced in the UK and Ireland. That's over 150 million items. They say it would take 80,000 years to view the whole collection. Well, we haven't got time for that. So let's quickly remind ourselves of what authors and books are in the running for the Nestle, which used to be known as the Smarties Book Prize. In the five years and under category, there's Lost and Found by Oliver Jeffers, Wolves by Emily Gravitt, and The Dancing Tiger by Malachi Doyle. In the six to eight years group, there's The Whisperer by Nick Butterworth, Corby Flood, by Paul Stewart and Chris Riddell, and this bloke with Sad Book. And in the 9 to 11 category, there's I, Coriander by Sally Gardner, The Scarecrow and His Servant by Philip Pullman, and The Whispering Road by Livy Michael. The competition's been running for over 20 years, and the chair of the judging panel this year is Julia Eccleshare. Julia, how important is this competition? Very important. This is a prize that's substantially chosen by children. So for an author, it's a really big opportunity for them to know that their book is liked by children. It gives them a great boost in the trade, they get a little sticker on their book, and the previous winners include J.K. Rowling, Jacqueline Wilson, Philip Pullman. It puts you up in another league. And we'll have more from the awards ceremony later. So you've got all these awards. What have you got? You've got the Booker Man Prize. You've got the Orange Prize. You've got the Whitbread Award. And then think, you've also got all the awards for the children's books. What are they all for? Are they to celebrate books and literature? Or are they all hype, champagne and self-congratulation? The publishers say that awards are good for books. They make books feel sexy. They say to people, if you want to be with it and in touch, you have to read this. People who oppose them say things like, it's, it's too celebrity based, it turns literature into a branch of the pop industry. I don't think there should be fewer awards, I think there should be more. I think we need many more awards, regional, local, special interest awards. I'd like my library to hold an award. And what about your school or even your class? Imagine that, you sit round, you talk about all the authors and books that you've read, and then you have a ceremony, you invite in the local newspaper and maybe the author. I know I'd come. Well, the tension is rising here at the British Library in London, where we're expecting the results of the Nestle Children's Book Prize very soon. Earlier, we caught up with some of the contenders. Well, guys, Corby Flood is in the running for the prize. And what's the book about? It's a story about a little girl who gets on an old ocean liner that is travelling from one place to the other and not stopping in between. She's got a guidebook that tells her about all the exciting places she could see if only the ship stopped, but it doesn't. Right, now, one of you writes the words, one of you does the pictures. We actually it's far more complicated do everything than that. together. We plot, plan everything together. I write, he corrects. He's like a teacher, marks it. Sally, you're on the shortlist. Is that good? It's very good. And have you always wanted to be a writer ever since you were a child? No, I was severely dyslexic as a child and I didn't actually read till I was 14. The dyslexia doesn't go away, it's something I have to manage. And I always think of myself sending 
books to this little girl that I once was who couldn't read. So I'm now writing them for her. It's fantastic to be on the shortlist. When you think there are something like 10,000 children's books published every year, to be on a shortlist, even if you take all the categories, of nine books, that's fantastic. And to be one of three in a category is just uh, amazing. Two families of cats, one ginger, one black and white. Did I say families? They're more like gangs. They've been at each other's throats for as long as I can remember. They're rude, they spit, and they call each other terrible names. And they fight like, well, like cats, all the time. What happens in the story? What happens in the story, Nadra? Nick Butterworth's tale of feuding felines has certainly been entertaining these year two children at Parkview Primary School. We chose the book The Whisperer uh, mainly because of the story, the, the moral dilemma in the story. We felt it was uh, something that was um, quite important for the children to, to um, experience um, in terms of the, the two warring families of cats. Um, and then the very then Romeo and Juliet boy, boy, slant on it. Um, we felt they it was uh, something that the, the children would really get a lot out of, that, that moral dilemma. Who can remind us what's happening in this picture, Marion? Using the interactive whiteboard, we picked out key phrases and key words from the book. Um, and the children then were able to, to drag those words and phrases to be near to the character, so they were able to, to really show an understanding of how that character was feeling. Good girl, well done later in the week when we actually then undertook hot seating with the children um, and, and we had a special chair which we made up um, and we also had um, cat masks we, we made up um, ears for the children to wear and they, they were specifically related to, to characters from the book how do you feel about monty i hated monty i, th I was gonna kill him <laughs> As children are growing up, they find that they have conflicts within their class with their peers. And we felt that, that this was uh, a, a real important angle for us to take on the book, to, to, to really encourage a sense of empathy uh, with the characters in the book so that they could develop empathy with each other in class and, and playground situations, which we're then hopefully able to deal with, with better. Oh, Amber. Oh, Monty. Oh, yeah. <laughs> My prime aim is to produce books that children will love. Did you vote for at the end? You voted, scarecrow. You voted for the scarecrow. You voted for the scarecrow. The scarecrow. I voted for I Coriander. Ah. So which one do you think is going to win? Either um, the scarecrow or I Coriander, but I think I Coriander's got a pretty high chance. Away from the excitement of the Nestle Book Awards, I've travelled in time and space. A wholly appropriate move to introduce our next book, Cloud Atlas, by David Mitchell. The book spans centuries and continents, seamlessly weaving six tales of good and evil, civilization and savagery. It's thought-provoking and exhilarating. Here's David Mitchell in Chandleresque mode with one of his characters, a young journalist called Louisa Ray. Mr. Smoke slams the brakes. He gets out into the cool air and smells hot rubber. Back a ways, 60, 70 feet down, a VW's front bumper vanishes between broken ovals of foamy wavelets into the hollow sea. If her back didn't snap, she'd have drowned in three minutes. Bill Smoke inspects the damage to his car's bodywork and feels deflation. Anonymous, faceless homicides, he decides lack the thrill of human contact. A passage there from one of the six tales, but Julia, do these six tales make one novel? Yes, I think they do. As you start off, you sort of, you're, you're, you're sorry to move out of one story and into another, but once you've got the flow of it, yes, they do, because they go up to a kind of crescendo and then you come down through the same stories, or at least a different bit of those stories, on the way down. So by the time you finish the book, it does feel like a whole.
So, Grant, what are the differences between these six stories? Well, there's lots of differences in sort of uh, t time and place. So you've got one that's set in the 19th century in New Zealand and it's sort of written by this uh, American lawyer as a sort of as, as a journal and describing his his journey on a ship and then you've uh, the next one is written in sort of 1930s and it's this very cynical sort of young brilliant Cambridge undergraduate and it's his letters to his to his ex-lover who's a scientist at Cambridge as well and uh, then um, the third one is a sort of late 60s early 70s American so you've got lots and lots of different styles and genre dotting around from the past to the future. So Stacey with that, with the, if you like, the reader has to hop from one style to another to stay with the book. Does the, did you feel that made you an, an active reader? I think you can't read the book in any other way but in an active way because it is so different in the way that it, each section is approached that you have to consciously look for the links because otherwise it can be quite confusing to actually find how they are um, integrated. Sometimes I felt very distanced from it, and I think that's partly the style because it's it's so excellent and it's got such too flashy. A, yeah, a little bit too flashy, but also I think many of the many of the characters are profoundly unattractive. Almost <laughs> <laughs> all of them. Yeah, it's a very sort of bleak. Does that looking. matter? I mean, after all, in the in the modern novel, we're used to reading what uh, anti heroes, if you like, unreliable narrators. We're, we're, I think we're used the bleakness to bleakness matters. I think Grant's put his finger on. I think it's not yeah. the characters necessarily, but it's bleak. Yeah, and and you need somebody that you can relate to, and all of the characters because you're jumping from one narrative style to another it makes it very difficult to actually form a relationship with any of the characters yeah. Yeah. now let's put on our teachers and educational hats Grant yeah I mean certainly it's a very for me a very adult book a very interesting book that in lots of different ways with excerpts I think you could use with with some probably quite sophisticated kids but it's mm. not it's I, very think much that, an adult I think that book. the techniques used lends itself well to perhaps key stage five study at looking at the way that you can use different structures to actually that's, get your um, get your I story think. across more than just the link theme of mm. looking at um, a memoir I think it's about styles I think it's a very good book about what it takes to tell a story in a different style Back at the British Library for the Nestle Prize Awards. Nick Butterworth. And The Whisperer by Nick Butterworth won the six to eight category. I'm absolutely delighted. So thank you very much to everybody who's made this possible. Hey, In the nine to 11 bracket, Sally Gardner triumphed with I, Coriander, a fantasy adventure set in the time of Oliver Cromwell. I honestly, I can't believe I won this. It's <laughs> just amazing. Thank you very much. And Oliver Jeffers, Lost and Found, the tale of a penguin who goes AWOL from the zoo, won the five years and under category. I'll tell you, uh, uh, let you into a little secret about where the idea for the book came from. It was on uh, a true story about uh, a school in Belfast that went to Belfast Zoo on a day trip. And one of the pupils actually got into the penguin enclosure and stole a penguin <laughs> and brought it home and they had to keep it in the bath overnight until the man from the zoo could come the next day to collect it. So it's a legend and everybody in Belfast knows somebody who knows somebody who knew the people who did it. <laughs> but don't be getting any ideas next time around you're at the zoo. Thank you. Great story. That's all from Reading Aloud. See you next time.